The subcommittee on space will come to order. Thank you for being here. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recesses of the subcommittee at any time. Welcome to today's hearing entitled, The Commercial Space Launch Industry, Small Satellite Opportunities and Challenges. I recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement. The commercial space industry truly is an amazing industry. It generates hundreds of billions of dollars of economic activity, serving both the private and public sectors, all while pushing the boundaries of innovation and fostering the United States as a global leader in space. Part of this innovation is a new space spin-in phenomenon. Computer, data analytics, and IT technologies having their origin in our space program but more recently developed outside of the space sector are being reapplied for space specific purposes. Significant research and development investments are also being made in the United States to create and manufacture new types of small satellite technologies and application. One of the largest barriers to that small satellite companies uh, that they face is the cost of launch. Launch often accounts for a significant portion of a small satellite's overall mission cost. Recent government incentives for launch vehicle development may allow small satellite operators greater access to space. New launch vehicle test flights present great opportunities for small satellite operators to launch secondary payloads if the companies are willing to accept the primary payload schedule, mission profile, and, mi and mission risk. The development of a small satellite industry is also attracting investment for a new class of launch services to serve the specific needs and requirements of smaller satellites and associated on-orbit constellations. A number of American companies in various stages of development plan on offering dedicated launch services to the small satellite industry in the next few years. These companies hope to fulfill the unmet demand of the small satellite market. They also promise to provide more flexible launch services, such as delivery to unique orbits and rapid replenishment. There is a lot of change going on in the small satellite and launch services industry. Winston Churchill once said, there's nothing wrong with change if it is in the right direction. From my point of view, the investment and innovation occurring in the small satellite and launch industry is good for America, and it is an important step in the right direction. But change often presents both challenges and opportunities. Companies are seeking to supply the demand for greater small satellite launch capability in many unique and innovative ways. Some solutions carry more risk than others. Some solutions are easier to implement than others. Some solutions require government action and some do not. Today's hearing gives us the chance to explore these challenges and opportunities. One policy challenge is excess intercontinental ballistic missile motors. It is longstanding national policy that excess U.S. ICBMs or their components should not be used for commercial launch services. This policy is established in the 1998 Commercial Space Act and reiterated in the 2013 National Space Transportation Policy, which states, excess U.S. ballistic missiles or their components shall either be retained for government use or destroyed, and that departments and agencies may use them on a case-by-case -case basis. But should this policy be changed to allow greater use of excess ICBM motors for commercial launch services? This isn't a black and white issue, and the policy outcomes associated with either keeping or modifying existing policy will create winners and losers. And those in favor argue that many U.S. small satellites have launched on Russian Nepper vehicles derived from Russian ICBMs, and that by modifying existing U.S. policy, U.S. launch services could compete with Russia and bring this business back to America. Those in favor also argue that there is a cost to the taxpayer associated with storing excess ICBMs. By allowing the U.S. commercial launch industry to use excess ICBMs, you not only lower the tax burden, but also create potential revenue derived from the sale of these motors. 
Those that oppose the policy change raise legitimate concerns that allowing excess ICBMs to be used for commercial launch purposes could distort the market in the United States, undermine future investment, and delay innovations that are on the horizon. Access to foreign launch services is also a policy challenge for the United States small satellite industry. And I've heard from a number of companies that build and operate small satellites that there isn't enough capacity in the market at a price they can afford to meet their needs. India has stepped in and offered to fill in part this demand and is launching smaller satellites on their PSLV vehicle. The administration has provided a number of export waivers on a case-by-case -case basis for these launches, in part because India is becoming a strategic ally in South Asia. Unfortunately, the administration seems to lack a clear long-term policy to guide access to PSLV launches. What should U.S. policy be with regard to Indian and other uh, foreign launch vehicles? Another factor that may impact the small satellite market is reusability. We all watched with great awe the accomplishments of Blue Origin and SpaceX when they launched and recovered their first stages. ULA and Ariane are now planning partially reusable systems as well. Will partial reusability of launch systems lower launch costs significantly? And will it be the panacea for small satellite operators? Will they be able to overcome many of the past issues with reusability, such as refurbishment and maintenance costs? Only, will time, only time will tell. But I'm very excited about these recent transformative developments. Finally, are there any artificial government barriers to expanding opportunities for secondary payloads, hosted payloads, and ride shares? Is there anything that can be done to assist in the aggregation of small satellites on, a large, on larger vehicles so as to benefit from economics of scale? Are there technologies or policies that could allow for greater utilization? There's a great deal of promise in the future of space, but if we fail to provide long-term solutions to the issues that our nation faces, we may well lose our leadership in space. China stands ever ready to fill that leadership void at the national level. Russia and Europe will gladly fill that role from a commercial pers uh, perspective once again. We must provide a competitive legal policy and economic environment or other nations will happily step up. This would lead to an eroded industrial base, decreased national capabilities, declining international influence, and the loss of a skilled workforce. I, for one, will not allow that to happen on my watch. I look forward to learning more about these critical issues facing our commercial space industry and finding common ground and responsible solutions that meet the needs of our nation, grow our economy, and maintain our leadership in space. And now I'd like to recognize the ranking member, the gentleman from Texas, for an opening statement. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, good morning and welcome to our distinguished panel of witnesses. Uh, I want to thank uh, Chairman Babin, also my fellow Texan, for calling this hearing. Uh, before I begin, though, I would like to note that we received the final witness testimony statements and the hearing charter less than 24 hours ago, and this has made it very tough on member pre preparation and staff preparation likewise. And uh, in the future, I hope that we can receive the testimony and charter in a more timely manner. That would be very, very helpful. Um, now, uh, again, as a Texas member, ensuring the continued growth of the space industry and, ad and addressing the challenges within emerging sectors, such as the commercial launch industry, remain incredible, incredibly important uh, to me and my fellow committee members. Uh, thanks to the Johnson Space Center in Houston, uh, Texas, they have long been a leader uh, on space issues. Uh, now, as we move forward with commercial space flight, Texas is positioned to be a leader yet again with a growing presence of commercial tests and launch sites in Texas. Companies like Blue Origin and SpaceX are laying the groundwork for innovation and helping to inspire the next generation of scientists and engineers with their latest test sites in West and South Texas. The work of the private space industry is helping change the landscape for satellite launches by greatly driving down the cost of delivering a payload safely to space. 
Small satellites, also known as small sats, are contributing to the emergence of new startup companies that aim to provide rapid turnaround in services and technology advancement to improve and expand services at a lower cost, especially in the area of earth observation and data provision. U.S. leadership in this emerging industry has the potential to both create jobs and economic growth for the nation and to serve as an important source of U.S. innovation in an increasingly competitive and changing global marketplace. Additionally, universities and government agencies are exploring the increased use of small sets and for research, education, and training, technology development, uh, and conduct of government operations. Uh, one of the major challenges that small sets do face is, is developing uh, and building uh, the spacecraft, is finding a way to put the spacecraft in space and to do so in, a, in an affordable and reliable manner. Uh, today, options for placing a small payload in space include uh, the following, uh, that is using dedicated small launchers, uh, ride sharing uh, as a secondary payload on a launch primarily conducted for another purpose, uh, being a hosted payload on a commercial satellite and being ejected from a commercial dispenser mounted on the International Space Station. Uh, unfortunately, small sat users and operators are often constrained in their choice of launch options due to indi individual requirements, available budgets, and the unique characteristics of each option. As a result, small sat users and operators must make trade-offs between factors such as affordability, schedule, risk, and orbital placement. For example, since the primary payload customers, uh, uh, since the primary payload customer dictates launch conditions, users and operators of small satellites launched as a secondary payload have no control on either the, the launch schedule or the destination orbit of the launch vehicle. And while the secondary payload customers must accommodate any delay by the primary payload, they benefit from the lower launch cost. On the other hand, small sat customers who place a premium on when the launch must occur and into what orbit the satellite needs to be placed may opt to launch using a dedicated launch vehicle despite that option's higher cost. So it is not surprising that a number of providers are seizing on this opportunity to offer additional launch options to meet existing uh, and projected demand by small stats. Uh, two recent proposals uh, have been made. The first is to allow the Air Force to make its excess intercontinental, intercontinental ballistic missile motors available for purchase and uh, later in use in commercial launches. The second is to facilitate U.S. commercial satellite operator access to Indian launchers. Uh, I hope that we can have an objective discussion with the panel on the pros and cons of these proposals and identify possible unintended consequences as well. Such a, a discussion is critical because both of these proposals are likely to require changes in statute and policy, uh, which this committee would have jurisdiction over. However, we also need to hear from the relevant government agencies, and I hope the chairman uh, and others that we will have the opportunity for a future hearing uh, at which we can get the perspectives of affected federal agencies. Uh, in closing, it is clear that we need a thoughtful discussion of these complex issues, uh, one that will enable the U.S. to capitalize on the innovation and job creation that is sure to come from designing and building and using this very exciting technology. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Vesey. Appreciate it. Um, I would like to thank the witnesses for being here today, and I'd like to introduce them. As you may know, last week was the 32nd Space Symposium in Colorado. Both of our witnesses have been extremely busy preparing for, for and attending the symposium. And so I very much appreciate that they were able to pull together their testimonies and attend this hearing on, very, on such a short uh, notice and short turnaround. Uh, the committee received a number of letters from stakeholders, and then I ask unanimous consent to include them in the record and let me introduce our witnesses. First is Mr. Elliot Pullum, uh, our first witness today. He's the Chief Executive Officer of the Space Foundation since 2001, and his role as, at the Space Foundation Mr. Pullum has, uh, leads a premier team of space and education professionals providing services to educators and students, government officials, news media, and the space industry around the world. Before joining the Space Foundation, 
Mr. Pullum was senior manager of uh, public relations, employee communication, and advertising for all space programs of Boeing, serving as spokesperson at the Kennedy Space Center for the Magellan, Galileo, and Ulysses interplanetary missions, among others. Mr. Pullum has a degree in journalism and mass communication from the University of Hawaii, Manoa. Second, Mr. Eric Stalmer. Our, uh, uh, and we appreciate uh, Mr. Stalmer being here today as well. He's president of the Commercial Space Flight Federation since uh, 2014. In his role, Mr. Stalmer constantly promotes the industry and member companies through his outreach of high-ranking officials and high-profile media outlets. He also promotes the mission of CSF through participation at multiple industry conferences throughout the year. Mr. Stalmer, a Master of Arts degree, uh, has a Master of Arts degree in public administration from George Mason University and a Bachelor of Arts degree in political science and history from Mount St. Mary College. I now recognize Mr. Pullum for five minutes uh, to present his testimony. Thank you, yes, Mr. Sir. Chairman, and thank you, members of the committee. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today, and I thank you for the opportunity to testify on matters having to do with space launch and satellite markets. In addition to my testimony, I'd like to enter into the record a brief report on these markets, which was gleaned from our online research source, The Space Report, which has been included as an addendum to my remarks. I'm here today to provide perspective and data on behalf of the Foundation. We're a 501c3 nonprofit, non-governmental organization, and we strive to be an entity that all stakeholders in the space policy realm can trust to provide fair, balanced, and well-researched information. The easiest way to characterize the current international launch market is, is that it is highly competitive, abundantly supplied with a variety of launch systems, and with new systems and suppliers entering or attempting to enter the market virtually every day. In 2015, there were 39 different major launch vehicle models in operation, 39. Uh, and they accounted for 86 launches around the world. In simple math, this is less than three launches per vehicle, which is not commercially sustainable, and it means that some systems enjoy a backlog of orders, while many, many launches depend upon government involvement of one kind or another. Regarding the notion of permitting or prohibiting access to foreign launch services, our experience is it's very hard to characterize level of, levels of government support for many competing systems because of the different cultures, economies, types of government, perceived societal roles, and so forth. But it is safe to say that there are very few launch systems in the world that have not had some kind of government support at one time or another, although I think this is certainly beginning to change with the advance of small commercial launch vehicles. Uh, the issues, I think, before us have to do with fairness to the satellite manufacturers of the U.S. and our allies, uh, reasonable access to launch options, and attention to security concerns that do not constitute a broad or overly restrictive reach by regulators. The impact of ITAR restrictions over the past 20 years has mostly been a body of unintentional consequences that have injured U.S. satellite manufacturers while promoting the development of so-called ITAR-free and no U.S. content satellites in Europe and Asia. Many of the satellite orders once routinely filled by U.S. companies are now filled by others, even good friends and allies who really, really would like to buy American uh, find themselves frustrated uh, still. Uh, significant changes to ITAR have been made, but implementation of the changes within the government has been slow. Recently, there's been some discussion about allowing U.S.-built satellites to fly on boosters, such as the Indian PSLV. Uh, this kind of discussion has taken place before in the case of allowing U.S.-built satellites to fly on Chinese boosters, which was permitted but came to an end in the late 1990s with the failure of a Long March booster and the subsequent accident investigation, which resulted in the ITAR changes mentioned. Since then, no U.S. satellites have flown on Chinese booster. I think the concern about using Indian boosters is not so much to transfer a te sensitive technology to a nation that's a fellow democracy, but rather whether the Indian launches are subsidized by the government uh, to a degree that other market actors uh, would be priced out of the market. I would point to the chart that in my testimony that shows the launch rates for the past decade. India has not managed to launch more than a half a dozen times a year. They've also had some reliable reliability challenges with their systems and I do not see them as a clear and present danger to U.S. launchers quite yet. 
Um, with the boom in small satellites, there's also a boom in the development of launchers dedicated to small sat, CubeSat, NanoSat, whatever you want to call them, market. Uh, the boom has numeric interest, but its market impact remains to be seen. Total mass of nanosatellites launched in 2015 only equals 1% of the total mass launched. If it were not for the unique orbits required for various small satellite missions, all 120 of the nanosats launched in 2015 with a combined mass of less than 500 kilograms uh, could have been orbited on a single Delta II launch vehicle. Um, as regards these new constellations that we're seeing, we've seen a similar story before when forecasts for thousands of new small satellites were envisioned for systems like Teledesic, which I had some experience with. These led to wildly ambitious launch forecasts in the 90s, uh, which did not materialize and have had a negative impact on national security space ever since. Uh, then, as now, there was enthusiasm for the spin-in of technology and management architectures from the non-space world. Uh, but space was and is hard. The ability to succeed in cellular communication did not translate into success in the satellite marketplace in the 90s, nor does acumen in information technology necessarily equate to satellite success today. Many of the investments being made in small satellites are driven simply by the smaller costs of the spacecraft. Small cost and big capability seldom arrive hand in hand. Um, the other major policy considerations that accompany this proliferation of small satellites has to do with the necessity of getting our arms around a space traffic management regime, which will ensure continued long-term access to space for operators of all sizes. And I'm sure you've all heard the three Cs, space is congested, contested, and competitive, and it's only getting more so. Um, I don't want you to think that I'm not uh, uh, excited about this emerging uh, sector uh, or that it's necessarily doomed to the face of the little Leo phenomena of the 90s, but rather I'm saying we need to be cautiously optimistic and not overly bullish. Uh, at a recent House Armed Services Committee, uh, General Hyten uh, said it was incredibly difficult for a government to accurately forecast launch industry trends and say with certainty where the industry will be several years from now, and I would say it's difficult for anyone to do that. Um, technology improvements have resulted in better components, uh, less expensive technology. I'm not saying it's not as good as, as uh, other satellite stuff that's out there. Um, and the emerging players do offer technology advances uh, such as rapid iteration, constantly increasing communication speed, bandwidth, et cetera. Um, these capabilities may in many cases be complementary with legacy companies, products, and services. I think the Pen Pentagon's recent outreach to Silicon Valley speaks to the recognition that there are new things to be learned. Partially or fully reusable launch vehicles have been the holy grail of the space sector for ages. It is delightful to see progress being made towards reusability. Um, and uh, in, in wrapping up, because I've abused my time, I just want to finally address an issue that is larger than the focus of today's hearing, uh, which is the future of the country in space and how we ensure U.S. leadership in space. Last, uh, last uh, month, the Space Foundation, along with 13 other space-related associations, including Mr. Stalmers, uh, released a paper, Ensuring U.S. Leadership in Space. The document is intended to be a non-political statement from the space industry to inform candidates for office uh, and educate them of how important and essential space efforts, technologies, and capabilities are for all Americans. Uh, I encourage you to read this document and ask that you insert it uh, in the record of this hearing. Again, thank you for allowing me to go a little bit over my time, and I look forward to your questions. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Pullum. Appreciate that. And I would now like to recognize Mr. Stalmer for five minutes for his t testimony presentation. Thank you, Chairman Babin and members of the subcommittee, and thank you for holding this hearing today. The Commercial Spaceflight Federation is the leading national trade association for the commercial spaceflight industry. Our members are responsible for the creation of thousands of high-tech jobs driven by billions of dollars of investment. Through the promotion of innovation, CSF is guiding the expansion of Earth's economic sphere, bolstering U.S. leadership in aerospace, and inspiring America's next generation of engineers and explorers. As the commercial space industry experiences rapid growth in demand, the U.S. launch industry is responding. Presently, the U.S. launch services market is dealing with demand in three ways. First, companies are investing a substantial, uh, capi substantial capital in the development of a new class of small launch vehicle systems, 
including Virgin Galactic, Firefly, Vulcan, and Rocket Lab. Second, through bundled satellite deals uh, on dedicated medium to intermediate rockets, lift rockets with SpaceX and soon Blue Origin and Sierra Nevada's Dream Chaser. And finally, through secondary payloads, companies with small satellites piggyback on larger satellite launches. Planet Labs, with its large constellation of small remote sensing satellites, has flown to orbit as a secondary customer on a number of flights already. While small satellite customers benefit from being a secondary payload through fractional pricing, we acknowledge that the status as a secondary payload does result in trade-offs for the small satellite customer. The best solution for access, for the small, access to space for small satellite companies will be when there are dedicated U.S. small launch providers coupled with options for bundled launch services on larger rockets and more opportunities to ride to space as secondary payloads. With the growth in demand for domestic space launch, the need in the near term for the state-of-the-art launch facilities is really necessary. There are numerous spaceports that are well positioned to support existing and new launch vehicles that are coming online. The more U.S. launch vehicles available will provide more opportunities to access space from our many spaceports. And even as the ink is still wet on last year's Space Act, Congress is now facing efforts to reverse decades of sound policy with respect to the, the commercial use of ICBM assets. The vast majority, but I, I will note not all of CSF's 70 member companies oppose the efforts to reverse this policy. There are some in the DOD and the defense industry that are advocating for releasing old ICBM rocket motors for use in the commercial marketplace. Those advocating for this change seek to buy the rocket motors at substantial discount and then compete against U.S. companies that have developed their own launch capabilities using private capital investment. This proposal is counter to the longstanding U.S. law and policy. Wholesale conversion of ICBMs into space, transfer, space transportation vehicles risks placing the government in the position of competing with the private sector and could have long-term consequences, and we've seen this in the past. Such behavior risks undermining investor confidence as well. By consistently reaffirming 30 years of U.S. commercial launch policy, improving regulatory stability, and promoting pro-growth policies, the United States government has fostered a healthy development of the U.S. commercial launch industry. And we are seeing this policy bear fruit today. CSF encourages this committee to pose any changes uh, to the existing policy with respect to the commercial use of ICBM assets, the reasons that I've outlined in my written testimony. CSF also opposes efforts to facilitate a government-subsidized foreign launch company, in this case India, to compete with U.S. companies. Such policy runs counter to many national priorities and undermines the work uh, and investment that has been made by the government and industry to ensure the health of the U.S. commercial space launch industrial base. At the same time, we look to at the same time, we have to be cautious not to squeeze out the U.S. satellite manufacturers and the operators that have immediate launch needs, which cannot be served by, by the aforementioned U.S. commercial launch vehicles that will be coming online later this year. If it can be shown that there's no viable U.S. launch opportunities in the given time frame to a required orbit, launches on Indian vehicles should continue to be considered on a case-by-case -case waiver review for U.S. payloads has been the practice for the last several years. This practice should continue while still relevant, but within, with the knowledge that this is definitely a temporary solution. In conclusion, on behalf of my 70 member companies, I appreciate the opportunity to testify in front of you today. American industry is responding to market demand and innovating on new technologies and outpacing any other country in the world. We seek to preserve this national leadership in space. And we look forward to working with this Congress to achieve these goals. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Stalmer. Um, I now, the chair now recognizes himself for five minutes for questions. Um, this is directed to both of you. The United States has retained a number of excess intercontinental ballistic missiles and component parts. Current law permits these ICBMs to be converted for government use as space launch vehicles, but only if certain conditions are met. Current law does not permit these ICBMs or their component parts to be converted to commercial launch vehicles. 
Recently in Space News, we saw dueling op-eds written by George Whitesides of Virgin Galactic and Scott Lair of Orbital ATK regarding how changing the current rules to allow excess ICBM motors to be used for commercial launches would impact America's space industry. Lair says that U.S. companies are losing small satellite launches to international competitors, specifically Russia, because of these restrictions. Whitesides, argue, Whitesides argues that allowing excess government ICBMs to be used for commercial launches would undermine the nascent U.S. small satellite launch services industry, which has heavily invested in the development of new uh, launch vehicles. What would be the advantages and disadvantages of amending the law to permit wider use of excess ICBMs for commercial space launch? Mr. Pullum or Mr. Stalmer, who, who wants to go first? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as, you, uh, as you note, this is a fairly recent and highly contentious issue. Uh, and uh, at the aforementioned Space Symposium last week, I had a, a considerable uh, amount of lobbying uh, from both sides of the issues, from many of our member companies, and, and, and there is a disparity of opinion. Um, the Space Foundation has is, is always prided itself on being a consensus-based organization. When we uh, put together our pioneering report that uh, Congressman Bridenstine has, has uh, incorporated in his uh, American Space Renaissance Act, and, uh, and we, took, we took a year to do that so that we could address all the, uh, all the concerns and make sure that what we came forward with was something that the entire space community would rally behind and benefit from. And similarly, the white paper recently on ensuring U.S. leadership in space, uh, bringing 14 organizations and taking about seven months to write what's essentially a three-page paper. Um, my, you know, our view right now is, is there is not consensus on this issue, and so we really are not going to take an, a, a stand one way or another. I think that the ideas need to play themselves out in the marketplace. Uh, I'm not a believer in the no-win scenario or the zero-sum game. I think that there is probably a path forward uh, for consensus, uh, but that will take some time. Mr. Stalmer. I will take the, uh, the path of the choices, the advantages or disadvantages. I'll lean to the disadvantages first. Um, flooding the market with cheap government motors <coughs> would certainly tilt the playing field uh, from the commercial industry. There's many companies out there that have invested a significant amount of private sector investment uh, in developing a marketplace, developing vehicles to address this very market that we're talking about. The longstanding government policy, and, uh, which has been around for 30 years, serve, uh, several different administrations, is sound policy. Uh, we, we saw the effects that it had of uh, the government in the marketplace during the shuttle era when the, the uh, government was launching commercial payloads. In 1980, the United States had 100% of the commercial launch market. By, uh, I believe, 2010, we had 0% of that commercial launch market. So it, it's a dangerous precedent to go down, and there, there's a lot of different reasons, uh, not just the cost. It stunts innovation. We have companies out there in Texas, in California, uh, all over the world, um, probably in every state that, that is represented here on, on, on the dais, um, that are developing innovative technologies. And I think a step back in this direction uh, would be a tremendous, one, it would send a message in innovation and it would send a tremendous message to, in, to the investment community on whether, you know, government policies should be adhered to or followed as we move forward. Um, a lot has been said on, on the type of these, these vehicles and the cost savings to the Air Force. As we look at it, it it's very difficult to find that, that cost savings that the Air Force is, uh, is looking for. And, um, and Mr. V uh, Congressman Vesey, I, I apologize on the delay uh, on the testimony. As, as we mentioned, we were both out, uh, Elliot, in a much greater fashion at, at the space symposium, um, where we worked uh, extensively with meetings with um, many of the different companies that are involved on this issue, and also where the Air Force stood on, stands on this issue. And, and that's also uh, a very difficult um, position to find at times. Uh, you can talk to some of the most senior members of the Air Force that have no opinion or no knowledge of this issue on Tuesday, and on Thursday the Air Force is coming out and saying, you know, maybe we should evaluate this, and there is a sweet, there could be a sweet spot, and, but we don't want to upset the apple cart with the, um, the commercial sector. 
Um, as far as the tax savings goes, a lot of it comes down, what is said, it's the surveillance and monitoring and maintenance of this fleet of ICBMs. There's over 900 of these potential missiles that the, the Air Force is, is um, safeguarding, monitoring, and surveilling. If you just perhaps say that we're going to give 50 of these motors to the commercial marketplace, uh, you still have 850 of these motors that you have to surveil and monitor and watch and everything. If you rent storage space, and just because you take you know, some items out of the storage space, you still have to pay for that storage space. And also, this is a sunk cost that the taxpayers have paid for for their intended purposes. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of concern um, with this and how it could disrupt the marketplace, it can disrupt the private sector investment. I, I certainly see it, and, and I, the, the debate um, back and forth has been tremendously cordial um, w with the companies that are involved uh, and thoughtful. And for my companies, we, you know, we represent uh, most all of the spaceports in the U.S. We have over 10 spaceports that we represent. And I see the concern that they have because the spaceports, to stay in business, you need to be launching vehicles. And I am all for that, and I want to see uh, them grow. I want to see other U.S. launch companies grow. But I think by, if you shut off this, the in capital investment, by you know, l tilting the playing field, uh, it'll certainly impact on other launch companies and limit the amount of launch companies that could be, be launching at these spaceports. So I apologize for the long answer on that. Okay, sir, thank you. Um, okay, now I'd like to call on uh, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Vesey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I wanted to ask uh, both members of the panel, uh, there seems to be a lot of emerging activity uh, in both the small set and small launcher, launcher arenas. Uh, a few years ago, dedicated small launchers were greeted with lukewarm reception and the demand never really materialized. Uh, what has changed this time around to make the small launchers more attractive? Money. I would say money. There's, there's tremendous investment capital. Um, uh, Elliot had mentioned earlier in the uh, late 90s with these, these pie-in-the-sky ideas, these large, huge commercial uh, constellation. I think the technology was almost there, but the funding wasn't there as much, and, uh, and the capital markets froze up. The capital markets aren't freezing up right now. There's a tremendous amount of investors. There's crossover investors that are investing not only in the, these large satellite constellations, but also in the launch vehicles that will provide, you know, provide access to these constellations. So I, I think that's uh, the, the, probably the biggest difference right now from what we saw in the past. Um, and it's the, it's the tremendous need for big data, big, big data data, I'm sorry. Um, but it, there's a tremendous need there for Internet access as well as, you know, remote sensing needs, the satellite communication needs. So as, as our, our appetite for this grows larger, I think you're going to see the need for these larger uh, constellations. I would agree with uh, with Mr. Salmer's comment, comments. Um, I think uh, you know a couple other things are at play. The, the large constellations that had been proposed in the 90s were really uh, about uh, building uh, telecom backhaul and video backhaul. And today we're in a world of much more direct to consumer uh, use of the satellites and their data. If you if you look at the largest category of of uh, commercial satellite activity, it is direct home broadcasting. Uh, followed by uh, GPS, which is direct to consumer. Everybody that's got one of these little iPhones or whatever you're carrying, you've got a you've got a satellite ground station that you're carrying in your pocket. Uh, I, I think the other uh, really interesting difference to me uh, that is somewhat about the money uh, is the degree to which there is great synergy now between the uh, the technical uh, and innovation focus uh, of uh, Silicon Valley and the people who are innovating in space uh, and, and contributing to these startups in space. If you, if you look at, at uh, you know, uh, what's going on with, uh, with SpaceX, well, you know, they know a thing or two about Silicon Valley. They have connections there. And there's this, this whole locus of people who are, are uh, equally uh, interested and equally financially invested uh, in, these, in these markets that begin to integrate themselves. And so I think you have a a more directly relevant uh, set of investors that is much better uh, financially equipped than uh, the last time around and with uh, uh, a business model that is uh, much more sustainable. Uh, and the next question I wanted to ask uh, both of you again uh, is on the Indian launch vehicles. 
uh, what are the critical factors that are leading uh, U.S. commercial satellite operators to seek waivers to the U.S. policy on launching satellites on Indian launch vehicles? <clears throat> The challenge right now is that the satellite manufacturers are making satellites uh, at a quicker rate right now than we have the launch capability. So a satellite's not making money as, while it's sitting on the ground. Uh, currently, the, uh, the PSLV uh, launch vehicle, the, the Indian launch vehicle, PSLV, has a sweet spot uh, and has the capability of launching some of these, these um, uh, satellites right now uh, in, a, in a timely manner. We don't want to see our U.S. launches going overseas by any means, whether it's to India, Russia, or whomever else. But right now, from the satellite you know, producers and manufacturers, they need to get their, their assets up in the sky as quick as possible. I, I think this policy um, with the waivers and the review is a sound policy. I think it needs to be in place. I think we should you know, um, stringently look at every launch that is taking place in every vehicle that, or every payload that we're putting up on an Indian vehicle. Um, but uh, I, I think it really needs to be evaluated. And I think, as, as Congressman said earlier, time will tell on this. We hope to phase this out as the new um, generation of launch vehicles come online. And in addition to that, a lot of these payloads that are being launched on these Indian vehicles um, are only one-off prototypes. Because as they're being launched, they're not being launched in a dedicated orbit. They're being launched with the orbit that it's putting on. So it's mainly the, the prototypes of these vehicles, uh, these, um, these payloads. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Vesey. I'd like to call on the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Posey. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. We got a lot of discussion, but still a relatively small amount of information um, about the engines themselves. Uh, like each one of you to just swag what you think each one of these engines would be worth on the market. It's hard to say, but I would say if you were trying to launch that payload uh, or that class of payload, whether it's 1,200 pounds or, 50, or 1,200 kilograms or 1,500 kilograms, what would it cost on a commercial variant of that vehicle? And I'm guessing that that variant would probably be in the $30 million neighborhood. Uh, I think uh, the, the, actually, okay. the, the motors would be about in the $30 million vehicle. Okay. Uh, vehicle. The motors would cost about $30 million, I believe. Each. So, each. Okay. But I, I think certainly as if you go forward, a detailed cost analysis would have to be in place to see what the actual cost is, what the, what the government cost, what they should be charging, things of that nature. Yeah. What you do. Votes, okay. Um, uh, Congressman, thank you for the question. Um, I, I would associate myself with uh, Eric's remarks in terms of, of detailed cost analysis being required. Um, we don't like to, to speculate, and, and if we were asked a question uh, and had time to answer, I would uh, task my research experts with talking with the Air Force about what they're willing to sell for, talking with customers about companies about what they're willing to pay, and try and come back with with uh, some so, some kind of a figure. Uh, I just I just have no idea at this time. Well, I you know it is so hard on the hill to get a yes or no answer out of anybody much less a, a good guess at, at, at a value, and I, and I really do appreciate you swagging that for me, and, and uh, it just gets us in the ballpark. Uh, would either one of you care to comment on the percentage of cost of the uh, launch vehicle the engine uh, is? So if you have one of these engines, uh, you have 50% of your program ready to go, uh, 33, 25, what, what do you think? Uh, again, Congressman, it's uh, it's an interesting question because each of these vehicles has different attributes. If you look at what uh, uh, Virgin Galactic is doing with Launcher One, their entire first stage is an aircraft, and so their model is fundamentally different. Uh, so uh, I just, uh, you know, it, it's, it'd be different for virtually every launch vehicle, I think. I think in the, the category of launch vehicles we're talking about, though, I think it is significant. Uh, it, it is the motor. I mean, you, you certainly need the guidance systems and the, the payload fairings and everything else, but certainly you build a rocket uh, around the engine yeah. and the motors. Yeah. But. 
but I'm not an engineer. I'm a poli sci guy, so I, I would stick to the experts on that. But I, if you're asking me for a wag, I would say it's it's significant par portion of the the rocket on yeah. this type. Well, of thing. I, you know, I'm 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 figuring that they would probably uh, like to have the whole rocket. You know, what would the payload be on one of the ICBMs that we're talking about accessing? The size of the payloads? Yes. Weight I, of the payload. I believe that the 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 payload range is anywhere from 500 kilograms to about 1,500 kilograms. Uh, I, and I think that's a, it's a rough estimate because it falls in the medium size payload uh, area. It's, you know, whereas uh, a Falcon 9 is a little bit larger, a Falcon 9 Heavy is extremely larger. What, what um, Virgin Galactic and Firefly are looking at are, are a smaller payload and the less than you know, 500 kilogram uh, payload, maybe about 300 kilogram payloads. Yeah. So the question is, if, if, if I could just buy one of the ICBMs, you know, take out the current payload, now I own it. Um, what would the market demand be uh, for the 500 to 1500 uh, range payload? Well, that's the challenge. It, it, it could, the market demand is high for that, depending on how you use that, that payload or that, that rocket. So for instance, um, just recently, uh, I don't have the exact date, but a few months ago, SpaceX launched uh, the Orbcom uh, constellation of satellites. And they, they basically bundled, uh, I believe, 11 satellites. And then they, they dispensed these satellites out. So the, the, you, if you aggregate the payloads, it ranges. If you're just looking for, you know, to use this launch vehicle for one payload, a, a thousand kilogram payload, then, then there you go. There, there may be a market for that. I'm not sure of what that mid-class market is. But I know mostly what we're talking about now, you know, when you're talking about a much larger market, you're talking about the geostationary market, which is a lot large, or it's, it's very stable. We know almost exactly what that will be and who will be launching it. With these smaller satellites that are going up, these smaller constellations, and I, I have a graph I could share with you and, and the breakdown of the, the, the weight and the, I, the I size. I just wanted to talk for it, so I like that. Yeah. And, and I was thinking like one web. So one web will probably, what one web is looking to do right now, and they have already aligned uh, of their 700 launches, they're going to go with uh, an Ariane, Ariane Space Launch Vehicle, as well as augment with some of these smaller, um, the smaller aggregation with Virgin Galactic. So the Virgin Galactic will, will maybe launch, you know, several, a handful of satellites at a time where the Ariane variant can launch a much larger amount because it's, it's larger payload. And I think Elliot has a chart on that. Yes, Congressman. In my testimony, there's a chart from our research folks that, that shows from 2006 to 2015 the breakdown of various masses uh, that were launched. And in the area that we're talking about, the medium, uh, 501 to 1,500 kilograms in 2014, just eyeballing it, it looks like it was probably 13 or 14 percent uh, of what was launched. And in 2015, probably only about 9 or 10 percent. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Rohrbacher. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, actually, uh, is it okay? No, he's All right. passing. All oh, right. Oh, my You're gosh. going next. <laughs> well, he usually refutes me after I get said that. <laughs> uh, no, well, the, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. This is, um, you know, we have perplexing issues here in Washington, D.C., and this is one of the perplexing issues. Because we know that uh, uh, greater, one of our great assets is this new and thriving and uh, futuristic uh, uh, space uh, transportation systems that we have now being developed in the private sector. And uh, uh, at the same time, uh, we do have, we have made a lot of investments um, when they were needed uh, during the Cold War, et cetera. Uh, in rocket and missile technologies that are there waiting and, and what to do with them in a way that uh, would not undermine these people who are not changing the rules in the middle of the game for those people who now have invested in this new industry. So let me suggest that it is not an unsolvable uh, formula that we're looking for. Uh, we know that it's a pretty well... It, it is pretty well understood that the government does have a right to have launches on these ICBMs uh, 
for government purposes, for a government uh, uh, mission. Isn't, is that correct? I mean, we're not uh, saying the private sector isn't saying no. They've got to go with the private companies, even though the government has the capability of doing it itself. Is that correct? That's pretty well That's right. understood. Okay. Well, then the problem then, let me just suggest that the government, there, maybe we're under, uh, are not looking close enough to see that there are things that the government needs to do in space that will help alleviate this problem. Uh, for example, if you have a certain number of space vehicles that are there, like ICBMs, and waiting, well, we didn't build them because we wanted them to drop nuclear weapons on the Soviet Union. That's not why we built those. We built those just in case there was a war, but we didn't want that to happen. Well, there are lots of things we need to do in space that would also mean that we'd have to have this capability. How about cleaning space debris? How about making sure that we have a new commitment to making sure, and that would be a federal commitment, and that these rockets would be used for things like that? Or how about global protection against meteorites or asteroids that might come and destroy the planet if we don't have uh, uh, the capability of dealing with that? Those are, you know, we have things we can do that, that the federal government has to do and has to be part of. If we don't clean up the space debris, uh, we're not going to be able to do this business in space. It will undermine our, our the, the private sector anyway. So we need to do that. It needs to be done by the by by the federal government. It needs to be a federal program. And so m maybe we can dedicate uh, uh, these uh, ICBMs to missions like that. And uh, rather than trying to undermine uh, our people in the private sector who've invested huge amounts of money in order to build this capability uh, without thinking their federal, the federal government was going to change the rules of the game and undermine uh, their efforts to, to operate in the market. So uh, anyway, I, uh, that's just the thought. We, so what I, the bottom line is we need innovative technologies, but I think what we need, Madam, Mr. Chairman, is not just innovative technologies, but we need in innovative policies and perhaps uh, uh, expanding the role uh, the, uh, and getting the job done that we need to get done in space uh, and focusing on that may help us overcome this per perplexing issue that we're discussing today. And you've got about a half a minute to, to say yes or no. <laughs> space debris is a huge issue, and, and uh, I never thought I would see a time when the commercial industry uh, would, would be uh, anxious to try and find ways to regulate itself because of the environment up there. We're, we're starting to talk about space traffic management, which has been an off-subject uh, thing in, in recent years. So, I, you know, absolutely space debris is a huge issue, and anything we can do to tackle it is, is something we need to do. Even with those... Uh, even when the uh, old ICBMs might play if, a role. If they can play a role, let them play a role. I would say no on the ICBMs um, because uh, China had a satellite that they, uh, they justified that there was a dead satellite and they wanted to take it out of that orbit and they used an ICBM as an ASAT weapon. And as we were tracking, the U.S. tracks over 20,000 pieces of debris because of this China ASAT that took place by shooting a piece of debris, uh, it caused about 5,000 pieces of debris. So that would not be the best way, I would say, to use this, but I think to, to focus the Air Force's technology on space traffic management, and if there's a way to use these, these, vis, uh, these vehicles in that regard, um, I'd be yeah. for it. I think the suggestion wasn't that the ice right. yeah, yeah, not that piece of debris. You, right. Yeah, you weren't proposing not, to blow not these one things for up. One. And, and not one for yes. one. Yeah, no. but it might, we might have some big machine that we put up there. That's that right. Could actually, if we, uh, if we could do that, I'd be all for that. <laughs> okay. Thanks very much, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. Thank you. Good line of questioning. Let's see. Now, the gentleman from Colorado, uh, Mr. Perlmutter. Thanks, Mr. Chair. And uh, Mr. Rohrbacher and I often disagree, but a lot of times we agree. And he and I are on the same page uh, when it comes to creating some kind of formula that both encourages uh, private development of launch systems to carry, you know, smaller satellites to really maximize the, the private uh, endeavors here, but also maximize the investments that taxpayers have made, whether they're from Colorado or California or any place else in the nation uh, with all these ICBMs. So I think there will be a formula that will do both of those things. 
And, you know, may, and I, I agree, we want to use the ICBM not to blow something up up there, but to maybe be the vehicle that, Certainly. you know, has the snow plow cleaning up the, the junk up there. So, you know, one of the things I want to see encouraged, and I think we're seeing this development, is with the, the small satellites, the CubeSats, the microsats, whatever you call them, to be able to have some kind of a launch system that really is dedicated to them. And so that, you know, whether it's some private, small private enterprise that's building the, the satellite or whether it's, you know, a university developing the technology to go on a small satellite. I mean, I came in late, and you, I, my guess is you gentlemen have already answered this, but are those launch systems being developed? Um, is there something else we as a Congress can do to spur their development? And I'll turn it over to whoever wants to go first. Thank you, Congressman, and appreciate you being here. Um, and and would invite you to see some satellite uh, payloads being deployed from Fort Carson this summer. Uh, we are uh, involved with the United Launch Alliance on a program called Future Heavy, where we're going to be launching the world's largest amateur rocket uh, from Fort Carson and deploying about a dozen student experiments that are all in the in the CubeSat sort of range. So, hope you can join us for that. Uh, I think that, uh, as, as my colleague has, has, has uh, suggested, that the development is going very, very well. And so what we need to focus our efforts on is how to be non, uh, to not perturb, I guess, uh, the environment by acting without uh, really, really thinking things through. I think that the, uh, a lot of the launch companies have great innovative ideas. The architectures that they're introducing are, are very interesting. Uh, and they're working with lots of different spaceports, which is going to give people uh, a tremendous variety of options. So I think we're headed on a really good path. Uh, we've got a lot of private investment pouring in. And so I would say just let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. I would concur with Elliot on that. Uh, the, the process right now is working. We have uh, at least four or five small satellite launch vehicles in development right now that should be coming online uh, within the next year or so. I think any um, change in this policy, again, could be very disruptive to that process. A lot of this, you know, what you don't want is these companies coming to you for, you know, a handout or, you know, additional funding on it. They're doing it by themselves by private sector investment right now. And if we stunt that private sector um, investment growth, we're, we're going to have a large, you know, a much greater problem. Um, so I, I think we're, we're doing the right thing in that regard. Um, and even if the policy had would change, if you change it tomorrow, it would take at least a year to 24 months to to to, um, to transition these these motors into vehicles. I believe maybe a year, maybe, maybe but maybe more. So I think that's a, a challenge that we have. But I, but I'm all for you know as a taxpayer, as, as someone who served in the military for 25 years, I see the investment that these had, and I, and I think if there's a way that we can think creatively on how to use these. Um, these these missiles for not their intended purposes. Uh, I think it's ideal, and, and I'd like to come to uh, come forward with a solution. Try to find a solution to that. Okay, so I mean, I'm happy if you're telling me just let it develop on its own. That there really isn't any uh, major need for us to do something. That's fine with me. I do want to see us not pass up the opportunity to put the ICBMs to work in some positive fashion. Um, I guess I'm not afraid of India as being, you know, a launch uh, country for some of our small uh, satellites. So I'm happy just to be hands off. Uh, but I also have a responsibility as a member of Congress to make sure that the assets of the United States are used properly and not just thrown away. I, I certainly see your concern there from the taxpayer perspective, and it's, and it's greatly pr appreciated. But sometimes the hands-off approach also is, is appreciated to industry. If you see, and, and sometimes you need a little hand from the government and a pat on the back. But I think if you see the progress that the commercial sector has made, just in the last week alone, uh, or last two weeks, what Blue Origin has done out in West Texas uh, on, on proving their um, reusability, what SpaceX did with the, commer the commercial cargo launch that launched not only a cargo to the International Space Station, they put in their trunk an uh, um, uh, inflatable module by big, made by a commercial company, Bigelow Aerospace, that attached the International Space Station that was built, help, uh, the delivery system was built by Sierra Nevada from Colorado, uh, and all the different commercial players that were involved 
um, in, in that and launched from Space Florida. So um, there's a lot of tremendous growth going on in the commercial marketplace. I, I have one last question, if I could, Mr. Chair. So when I walked in, I wasn't quite sure if I heard this correctly, but did you say that these companies should get their assets up into space as soon as possible? Is that what you said, assets, I hope? I, I, I think, yes, the companies, and I, I think collectively as a nation, we should uh, get our other um, assets. Get our into assets space. up into yes, space. Yes. All right, thank you. I yield back. <laughs> Yes, sir. Thank you. I'd like to call My on. My mother might be watching, so I'd be careful. <laughs> I'd like to call on the gentlewoman from Virginia, uh, Ms. Comstock. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it's hard to have a discussion about commercial space and not mention Virginia's uh, Mid Atlantic Regional Spaceport at NASA Wallops, um, which is one of only four launch sites in the entire U.S. It's capable of launching to orbit, has served as a vital asset in support of our nation's space industry. So, um, there's been discussion on the commercial use of decommissioned ICBM motors, and I wanted to ask how potential use of these motors could benefit our nation's sp spaceports, including Mars. Well, we, um, we represent Mars and the great people at the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport. Dale Nash is doing a fantastic job down there, and I think it's a vital asset to the U.S. spaceports. Uh, and we are tremendously supportive of what, what he does. And I also should say, Congressman, tremendously supportive of what you do for McLean Little League and your, your support. You know, <laughs> I have you. three children. They're quite was a great involved. We, our, we have, um, we, we just had our uh, kickoff on Little League and Jason Worth throughout the first pitch, so that was fun too, right? I heard he was only going to be there because he knew you were going to be there. So. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, the space ports are vital to the, uh, the economic growth of our, our industry. It's a total ecosystem of what we're dealing with. Without these, these state-of-the-art, reliable space ports, we are not going to have the vehicles that we can put up into space and, and all the, the tremendous, tremendous benefits that we're going to get to space. So uh, we to say we support Mars, it would be an understatement because I think, uh, as I say, a vital asset. I guess our thinking would be, and, I, and, I, and they have a great partnership with Orbital ATK, another, another fantastic company who is right in the middle of this issue, and we want to see Orbital be la launching as many uh, vehicles as they can from Mars and from the other spaceports. Um, we see the value, though, without these ICBMs, that there's a potential of launching even more vehicles from those spaceports and, and that spaceport in particular. However, I think if we, if the government intercedes and cuts into the competitiveness of the commercial marketplace, as we've seen in the past, it could have really damaging impact on the industry as a whole. So instead of launching one or two vehicles from the, the, the spaceport per year, uh, you, you can go either way. You, you could, um, it could be you, we launch several or launching a few, and I think that's what we really need to examine. But tremendously supportive of the Virginia spaceport. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome, thank you. I think at this time we'd like to go back through uh, for a second round of questions, uh, if that's uh, amenable with everyone. Uh, I recognize myself for the first one. Uh, under the 1998 Commercial Space Act, uh, the federal government can use excess ICBMs for its own use as long as certain conditions are met. We've heard that numerous times today. This provision was utilized by NASA for the uh, LADEE mission. Uh, we've recently heard that the procurement for this mission was particularly onerous and resulted in a protracted protest to the GAO. As a result, we've heard NASA is hesitant to use excess ICBM motors on future missions despite being able to do so. What can the Congress do to make it easier for agencies to utilize existing authorities to use these excess ICBMs for governmental purposes? Both of you. Mr. Chairman, I think you, you cut right into the Armed Services Committee here. Um, the the, the issue, I think, is the difficulty of, of the contracting environment as, as regards uh, federal defense and space procurements these days. There's very rarely anymore a procurement that doesn't end up in court or appealed or challenged or protested or, 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 or whatever can be done. And so, uh, you know, I think that the, the issue is not one that's particular to launch vehicles of any kind. I think it's systemic within federal contracting and needs to be the subject of contracting reform discussions. Mr. Stalmer. And I think a lot of this discussion, you know, when you go through this, um, the research and the waiver process to launch on these vehicles, uh, a lot of this policy is the discussion on the potential of 
what if a launch failure happened of one of these ICBMs? I think that is, is a discussion and what this could mean to the, to the nuclear triad. I, I think that was where a lot of the area of pause came from uh, and, and the, the implication and the integrity of our ICBM um, arsenal. So I think there's a lot of broader policy um, implications involved with this. Uh, certainly the discussion with Congress on how we can streamline the, these processes um, it, it would be helpful in that regard because, again, the, the national policy does state that these, these assets can be used for, um, for defense and other uh, government missions and just they, I, you know, they need to go through that process. So I think it needs to be a thoughtful discussion involved on that. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then, uh, uh, again, General Hyten, commander of, of Air Force Space Command, stated in the Financial Times yesterday that a growing number of commercial launch ventures made him worry whether there was enough business to sustain them all, noting a similar bubble in the late 1990s that burst uh, when commercial satellite constellations went bankrupt. Uh, is the recent prosperity of the small satellite market a result of technological advances such as Moore's Law and spin-in from the techno technology sector, or is it a reflection of a short-term bubble in launch services brought about by government subsidies? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I certainly don't think it's because of government subsidies. I, I think that uh, you're seeing different, uh, different success in different sectors uh, of the space industry, uh, and that drives itself into the various types of satellites that are, that are being launched. Uh, in the case of the very small satellites, uh, it's really been the development of uh, microelectronics and the compression of processors and, and the, you know, the available of, availability of nanotechnology that is allowing these small satellites to be produced almost as a commodity. They're coming off an assembly line and, and students are putting them together and it's not the kind of intense clean room operation that major satellites uh, are uh, contending with. Uh, at the same time, the companies that have orbital slots where they're able to put uh, very high value satellites in geostationary orbit, they're not shrinking those satellites. They're putting more and more capability into them and more and more capability to stay in orbit longer. Uh, because the longer a commercial satellite is functioning, the more revenue they're able to see from it. Uh, and so you're seeing investments from, uh, from the commercial operators in things like research that will help them with, uh, with uh, satellite servicing. And I, I think it was Intelsat that just inked a, an agreement with somebody to do with a... With Orbital ATK. With, with Orbital ATK to do a, a, a demonstration of satellite servicing. So um, you have a, a different types of investment being made in different uh, uh, sectors of the industry. Uh, you do have, you know, the, the launch business is interesting. It really only comprises about 2 to 2.5% two of the total... Uh, space marketplace globally, but that two and a half percent works out to you know about three billion dollars or so. So that's not or six billion dollars. So that's not chump change if you want to be in that business. Um, so so there is a market for each of these things, and I think we, you know we need to uh, to trust the the companies that have business plans and business models to go after each of these segments, and, and to do so knowing that that some are going to succeed and some are going to fail. Uh, but I think that we're at a at a point in the maturity of technology and the maturity of the industry. Uh, and, and the depth of uh, financial strength behind these, that we're going to see more successes than failures as we go forward. Uh, I, would, um, I would say, in all due respect to General Hyten, uh, that I would, uh, I would gauge my, the forecast of the commercial marketplace more from the commercial marketplace rather than from the Air Force, uh, as well as through a lot of the organizations that are doing these forecasts, uh, in, in tremendous detail, you know, for instance, the Tory Group on their annual forecast of what venture startup looks like and on what the Space Angel, ne Space, Angels, Space Angels Network is seeing, as well as the FAA's forecast, annual forecast of what they see for these markets. Um, the way Silicon Valley has invested in these companies, I think, as I said, there's a lot of crossover investors that have also invested not only in the satellite um, uh, vehicles, satellite systems, but also in the vehicles that will be producing these. So um, I, I certainly applaud uh, General Hyten's passion on this issue, but I, I think um, unless they have reports that I haven't seen on these forecast reports on the commercial marketplace, um, I would kind of look forward to more of what the commercial forecasts are looking like. 
Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. It, it, and if I can add, uh, we've talked a lot about Silicon Valley investments and angel investors here. I think one of the hallmarks of, of, of where we are today is that the investment is not just coming from high-risk, uh, tolerant people, that a lot of the times when you see a, 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 uh, an investment made in a space company, you'll see a Silicon Valley company sort of as a lead or a face, but it'll be somebody very institutional like Fidelity Investments or one of the big banks back in New York that is putting a huge equity put into that because they see, uh, they see uh, profits and they see progress being made in other parts of the sector. They see what is is being accomplished, and their confidence to invest as in institutional investors is is quite strong. So, so that again takes it out of the realm of where we were back when we had things like Teledesic, when you were you know just uh, depending on somebody's uh, personal uh, individual wealth, but you're able to appeal to large financial institutions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Colorado uh, one more time, Mr. Perlmutter. Thanks, Mr. Chair. And, you know, obviously this is a frontier, but with all frontiers there's lots of opportunity and there is risk. And to the degree there are failures, you know, I spent my life before I was elected to Congress as a Chapter 11 lawyer, you know. So that's just the nature of private enterprise. And the fact is that more more companies, more individuals are willing to see this frontier for the opportunities that it presents. And if we have some mistakes or some things don't go, then that's the way it is. Now, I have a couple questions. Mr. Pullum, uh, deploying small satellites from the space station using a commercial dispenser is perhaps the most accessible on-ramp for new entrants to space. What is the importance of this asset for educational institutions and space research? Thank you, Congressman. It's, it's very important, and we're pleased to work with the folks at CASIS in Florida uh, on a number of programs appealing to students. But it, it is one of the largest uses of these small satellites is for universities and student research because they don't have access to the big national labs and platforms. And so the ability to go to someplace like CASIS, manifest your payload, and have it ejected from a dispenser, which I'm, it sounds like we're all eating Pez here, um, but it, it works, and it's, it's a very good approach. And, and what we're seeing is, is that other companies that have other solutions are also beginning to think about sort of the philanthropic part of this. Yes, we're going to put up a, a, a vehicle, and we've got room for, for five small satellites. Why don't we dedicate one of those to a university project? So I... It, it, the International Space Station continues to be a profound investment that pays off for this country every single day, and the, the, the ability to deploy small satellites is just one of many, many things the ISS has given us. Okay. Anything to add? Uh, absolutely. Completely concur. I mean, the value of the ISS has um, innumerable to, to speak of, um, and it is absolutely a great on-ramp for a lot of the, the type of payloads that are being launched from it. Um, as we move forward, I know a lot of these, these satellite payloads want to be get in their, their dedicated orbit that would be optimal for their, for their use, um, and whereas the ISS, you go out where they, they ship you out. So, um, but it is just an outstanding resource, and the work you know, that CASIS is doing is, is fantastic, and you know, the, the companies like NanoRacks that help support this, it's, it's great. Uh, similar to a question, a discussion we had with my last round of questions. So, this year, we found ourselves talking at length about how to transition from the Obama administration to the next president. These conversations will likely carry over after this year. What advice do you gentlemen have to our committee and the incoming administration, whoever it is, um, to support the growing commercial space industry? So, Congressman, thank you. Um, in my, uh, in my introductory remarks, I, I asked to have included a, a white paper that uh, our two organizations and, and 12 others worked on uh, called Ensuring U.S. Leadership in Space. And it's, uh, that paper was uh, written particularly to present an industry consensus on, on exactly this issue for, for people that are running for office, both those that uh, have and those that have not space experience. I think this committee is, is very rich in that you have a lot of people here who have this experience and can share that with other members. Um, the, you know, the, the, uh, the, the enemy that, that uh, seems to gnaw at, uh, at space programs in the U.S. is, is the enemy of transition from one uh, administration to another. Um, and I know this plays out in, in a lot of different parts of the space, uh, space community, but certainly where we see it the most 
visible is in NASA where it seems like every new administration wants to put their thumbprint on the program and we <laughs> stop and throw away billions of dollars worth of effort and start all over again. Um, starts and stops and redos are killing us and we have to get to a position of consistency uh, and, and many of these recommendations that we've made in the past are now in Congressman Bridenstine's bill that uh, he announced last week. And so uh, things that give uh, NASA and others in the space business the opportunity to do multi-year procurements, no-year procurements, uh, stability uh, in leadership, it's a highly technical enterprise and, and, and it shouldn't be subject to political, high political turnover. Um, and, and just a long-term vision of what are we intending uh, with our space industry, we have good I'm gonna, space I'm policies. I'm going to stop you for one Please. second, just to put in a plug for something I'm pushing, which is the orbital mechanical engineers say 2033 is the best time to get our astronauts on Mars because that's when we're closest. It saves a lot of travel time. And so my goal is to make sure we have something from a congressional standpoint suggesting to the administrations as they come and go let's get our astronauts to Mars at least by 2033, if not before then. And so you're absolutely right. A lot of starts, a lot of stops. We need continuity of mission. We need not to start engaging in things if, if the private sector is actually working its way through all of this. So 2033, just remember that date, and then Mr. Stalmer, if you had something you wanted to add, go for it. I think Elliot did a great job covering. I would say for the private sector and you know, the civil and military space, their goal should be to do, in regards to civil and military space, do what the commercial sector cannot do. This commercial, and I'm going to tell you all the great things that are going on in the commercial marketplace, but there's still uh, fundamental um, uh, science and, and technology that only the government has to, that uh, competency and capability of doing. So, you know, I know firsthand your staff and, and all the, the, the staff here has always been engaged with our member company, myself and our member companies, on knowing what our capabilities are, what our aspirations are, and what our limitations are. And, and I think we'll always be honest with you. And, and I think as we move forward, you know, from whatever new administration it's going to be, um, is, is that NASA has core competencies that they're very good at, as does the DOD. And you gotta keep in mind that the, the commercial marketplace will be there to help uh, throughout the way. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Yes, sir, thank you. Now I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Florida, uh, Mr. Posey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, still trying to quantify the uh, potential values and potential uses of our potentially expendable ICBMs. Um, is there anyone in the industry who uses the same motor now? I do not believe so. I believe that um, Orbital ATK is, is the subject matter expert on solid rocket motors. I, I could be corrected on that, but, but by and large, the majority of folks in the launch industry use liquid motors. Yeah. So um, Orbital is the, the, the one, Orbital ATK um, are that. And, and again, I can, I'll, I'll check for clarification, but I believe if, if they aren't, there, there's not that many others, okay. uh, but I believe they are the and, only and, one. And I was interested really in domestic, because I don't want them to go overseas. Right, by, right, yeah, by, of course. By any stretch of imagination. Uh, a little while ago, uh, you talked about uh, the United States having a hundred percent of the commercial launch market back in the 80s. Uh, and then I missed the last part of that sentence. We managed to parlay it into what? So the U.S. changed their policy. Um, the, the U.S., you know, the, the commercial launches, and then the, we changed the policy to go onto the shuttle. Uh, and, and then after the shuttle happened during that time frame, a lot of the Ariane space emerged uh, to take up a lot of those commercial um, launches because of the limitations that the U.S. launch companies had. So the, U the U.S. government was still launching, or we still were launching government payloads, but as far as commercial geostationary uh, satellites, the, the, we were at zero. Uh, and that has recently changed, I think, with the emergence of SpaceX. I think in 2010 we started uh, beginning to capture a larger uh, amount of the market share, and right now I believe Correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I believe that we have 60% of the geostationary commercial marketplace. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, m my recollection is a little bit differently. I think uh, we lost 
uh, the commercial market because we overregulate it while other companies subsidize and, and actually help their industries, uh, we choked the golden goose. And I think we managed to do that. I don't think there was ever a necessity for an area and uh, if they had left our commercial launch vehicles alone and let them do their job uh, without trying to fund uh, federal agencies uh, with what should have been uh, value added uh, or actually were non value added cost uh, to our commercial launch market. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Okay, well, I think this uh, pretty much wraps up the. Um uh, questioning for today, and um, I'd like to thank the witnesses very much for being here, <clears throat> and uh, I know there were some other folks that wanted to come back, but I, I think they had other meetings, so uh, I guess uh, the record will remain open for the, the two weeks for additional written comments and written questions from members who did not get to get back and ask their questions. Uh, so thank you again, witnesses. We appreciate it, and this hearing is now adjourned. Five minutes, huh? Did a great job.